Our next speaker will be Dr. Aaron Salzberg, who serves as the first special coordinator for water resources in the Bureau of Ocean, Environment, and Science Affairs in the Department of State. He has been the lead representative or lead water advisor for the United States at several major international events on water, including three World Water Forums and several G8 summits. He is responsible for managing the development and implementation of U.S. policies on drinking water and sanitation, water resources, and transboundary water, and will be discussing foreign policy and international water development. Dr. Salzberg? Actually, it's uh, four water forms now. Uh, but sorry, I'm trying to think how through to do this. First, a couple of apologies. Uh, one, I walk around and it's going to be hard to hear me. But maybe this will help. Two, um, I'm going to speak really fast. Uh, I'm very passionate about these issues. I talk really fast and I get passionate about them. I've also been asked to shorten my talk by about 15 minutes or so, so I'm going to talk extra fast. Uh, three. Uh, I've stolen liberally from so many people that I won't acknowledge in this talk that I gr really apologize to those folks, especially those who are out in the audience. Um, it's one of the benefits of being a, a diplomat. We get to pull from the best and the brightest that we have. I do that liberally. I'm not going to give them credit when I go through here. There's too much data in here to do that. But I want you to know this isn't my data. And I'm happy to point you to the right sources when we're done. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a quick sense of what the world looks like on water. I heard from a couple of folks who'd like to get a broad perspective of what the global water issues look like, why these things are important for a diplomat in the United States and for the United States generally in terms of our foreign policy and our foreign interests. Uh, three, what some of the challenges are in managing international water issues. And then four, a little bit about what we here in the United States are trying to do to address those issues. Uh, so that makes sense. I'm looking for nods. There are going to be some questions as I go through, so interaction is useful. Helps me out. Right. Uh, a little bit about the state of the world on water, and I heard you uh, heard had some of this a little bit yesterday, so I'm not going to go too far. Yes, no. That way. Good. Okay. Uh, very quickly, and hopefully you've seen much of this stuff already. I just want to point out this is per capita water availability throughout the world. Just to give you a sense, and everybody knows this, water is not evenly distributed. Many places in the world have water. Many places in the world don't have water. One of the things I want to point out here is that band up there in red that cuts across there. Keep that in mind as we go through a number of these slides. When you think about U.S. strategic interests, our defense, our peace and security interests, our development interests, and that band over there, you'll start to see a consilience between what we're seeing in, in water issues and our foreign policy issues. And that's a trend that continues through a, number, a lot of this data. So I wanted to start with this and begin to highlight that. Um, and it, this is old data, and I apologize for that, but it still makes some of the same points. Uh, right now, about 1 billion people, actually I think it's down to about 800 million people lack access to safe drinking water. That's really a misnomer. We don't know how many people lack access to safe water. All we know, all we count, is how many people lack access to an improved water source, a protected water source. So really, we don't know how many people lack access, but these countries in red are places where 50% of the population lack access to an improved water source. And most of the people who lack access are actually here in Asia, but the proportion of people is much higher when, when you look out uh, towards Africa. Uh, right now, about a third of the world's population lack access to basic sanitation. Again, uh, most of those people are over here in Asia. Oops, sorry, most of those people are over here in Asia, but a good, but proportionally, a large group of them in Africa. Why is sanitation important? Why is this something we have to be thinking about? Some my thoughts, ideas, health, other reasons. What's one of the key reasons why girls drop out of school? Uh, girls don't want to go out and when they share, when they have to go out and drop their pants in the back of their schoolyard in front of the rest of the classes, that's something they don't want to do. When girls reach the age of 12 or 13, one of the primary reasons they start dropping out of school is they don't have a private place where they can actually go to the bathroom. Critically important for a whole bunch of other reasons, not just health, but education, gender equity, a lot of things that we often don't talk about or hear about. When you take these two things together, the lack of access to safe drinking water, the lack of access to basic sanitation, uh, this is a significant health risk. Over a billion people per year suffer from water-related diseases. How many have you had drunk bad water, been sick? There you go. Oh, many of you. You've got to experience this. Uh, if you haven't experienced it firsthand, this is a 
this is something you'll remember. And even better, having a child go through it. Uh, that's an experience you will never forget. It will change your life, trust me. Um, approximately 1.85 million deaths per year. It depends on what you count the water-related disease. We can come back to that later. Uh, about 6,000 people per day. How many people die from HIV AIDS per day? About 8 to 10. It's about the same order of magnitude. So you're talking about the same group. Different target population. Most of these are children under 5. And that's very important when you're talking about water issues. The two populations that are most impacted by water, women who have to spend most of their time collecting, gathering water for family uses, and children who suffer most of the health impacts are also the most marginalized in political processes in many of the countries that we're trying to deal with. And that's a critical issue when you're talking about how you're going to solve some of these problems. We'll come back to that in, in a minute. When you look at those places in the world where water-related deaths are high, again, uh, many of these deaths are coming from the Africa and the Asia regions throughout the world. No surprises here. When you look at the causes of childhood death, diarrhea death is up there at number two. Uh, these things in red are the portion of deaths due to uh, underweightedness, malnutrition. And when you look at water and sanitation as correlation with underweightedness, there's a very strong correlation. So a large number of these deaths, too, could probably be attributed and have some sort of water-related component. So it wouldn't be surprising if water is probably the number one cause of death in children under five. Um, some of the other aspects of water that we'll talk about, and I know this graph's a little bit messy, but the takeaway message is that agriculture, these areas in green and orange and up in here, is the primary use for water in the developing world. And while it's about 70% of the world's water goes for agricultural uses right now, in developing countries that number can be as high as 90 to 95%. So it's a very, very, very large consumer of water in the developing countries. Uh, developing countries. When we look across those places that we care about, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where population is going to grow upwards of 70% or so over the next 20 years, that's going to drive demand for grain to go up. But also, as we heard Mark mention, demand for beef is going to go up as well. As countries begin to develop, they shift to higher caloric types of crops and food, food products. And as Mark mentioned, you know, growing a cow, sorry, that's not right, raising a cow? Yeah, right. Um, raising a cow requires a lot of water. And uh, I think Mark showed you a pound to make it a little bit more uh, uh, user-friendly. For a hamburger, I think it's, uh, what is it, Peter, 2,400 liters? Yeah, for a hamburger, 2,400 liters of water. So it's, it requires a lot of water. So as we shift to higher caloric types of food products, this too is going to be something that's going to drive water consumption in many places around the world. Um, the other thing that we often uh, don't talk about is what's happening to the land and arable land. And this is a very messy figure, but the takeaway here is that these areas in green are the only places where the land is being sustainably managed. And all, of, all those other places, the land is degrading for one reason or another. Um, I think we have some non-water people in here. To make it as simple, uh, when you leave a glass of water overnight and that water dries up and you see that white junk that forms in the bottom of the glass, that's actually salt from water. And that happens on land as well, too. When people dump lots of water on their land, those salts begin to build up. And at some point, that land doesn't become usable anymore. Critically important role, water plays a critically important role in maintaining arable lands uh, throughout, throughout the world. And again, I'm with the State Department. We, why, why would this be important to us? Well, and I'm sorry, I'm, I know you can't read this, but let, let's take Uzbekistan as an example. Well, right now, 90% of its crops come from irrigated land and already 60% of that land is salinized. Now, why would we in the State Department care about that? Well, for Uzbekistan, irrigated ag is 35% of their GDP. It's 60% of their foreign exchange earnings. It's 45% of their employment. Now, if you're in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and you're worried about peace and security, what's the one thing you don't want to see anywhere? Young men without jobs and nothing to do. So again, in critical regions like this where there's a potential for unrest, where there, where there are elements that support terrorism, these are places where, again, we're going to be very concerned about how water is used, how it fits into jobs, how it fits into productivity. When you look across the world, there are a number of places, and notice the data here is very bad. We, we just don't know a lot of answers to many of these questions. There are many places in the world where large tracts of land are vulnerable. And when you look at those countries, China, India, Uzbekistan, Iran, Egypt, you know, Uzbek these are all places where we have a very strong strategic interest. And again, these are places where water is going to play a key role in, in their futures. I'm sure somebody, you've heard groundwater today again, only to mention that when you look at these places in black where the water is being extracted at a rate greater than it's going in, uh, and that's 
fundamentally unsustainable, right? We all know that. You just can't see that. And again, look at this band. You know, when you think about places where we have strong strategic interests, again, a very strong overlap. Uh, the, the impact, of course, is disproportionate on poor populations. You know, this is an example from the North China Plain where it was about 40 years ago. You know, you could dig down three meters and you could access water. Now you have to go down in some places as much as 40 meters. Uh, the reason why that's, that's important, you get three meters, you could dig that hole. You know, people, anybody in this room could go ahead and take a shovel and you could put that hole in the ground. Once you get down to these levels, you need infrastructure to be able to do that, and poor communities can't do that. So they fundamentally have to get up and move. And so the over-abstraction of groundwater resources is going to disproportionately affect those poor populations. Uh, I'm not going to go into this. You've seen pictures about this the past couple of days. This is just a, a graphic on um, uh, Lake Chad. Uh, obviously, as we use these water resources, ecosystems and livelihoods are going to be vulnerable, and we're seeing this in places throughout the world. Declines in fish species and everything else are happening all over the world as well. Um, to give you an example of some of the economic costs, uh, the way we talk with our embassies and post over missions is uh, cables. That's the way we talk about it. And about a year ago, I got a cable from uh, the Philippines. And the Philippines is one of those countries where they actually have good coverage. 80%, 86% of their people have uh, safe drinking water, about 83 to sanitation. Yet 31 of all the illnesses in that country, 31% are still water related. And you know, that costs their economy about 70 million or so per year. If you factor in what the cost of their pollution on their fisheries is, which is another 500 million, you're now talking about 1, 2% of a country's GDP. And this is a country that was one of the blue countries at the very beginning. This is a country where everything is actually going pretty darn well. And here you're still talking about impacting a country's development by, by 2 to 5% of their GDP. Critically important when you're trying to pull countries out of poverty. Um, dams, we heard a little bit about this uh, uh, in some of the earlier talks today. In the United States, we have about 6,000 cubic meters of water stored per person. In many developing countries, that's almost a hundredfold less. And of course, the importance of this is, you know, here we can go a couple of years without rain and we can still maintain the water that we need for basic livelihoods as well as for production needs. In many of these countries, you can't. And we're going to have to find ways to improve this water storage just to maintain those livelihoods. When you look at disasters, and this is just looking at Africa, droughts, floods, famines, many of these are water related. And again, these things relate to water storage, how you manage water availability throughout the year. Again, critically important things for us here in the United States. Let's say you're still not sold that this is something that we have to be thinking about. Uh, this is a, a graph from the World Bank, and this is a percent change in real GDP, and that blue line is rainfall. It's been done for a number of countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. If you cannot disassociate these two lines, this country cannot pull itself out of poverty. It's just that simple. And so managing water is going to be the key to pulling many of these countries out of poverty. And how we begin to disassociate these two graphs, critically important question for, for many of us who work on these issues. Uh, you heard a little bit about shared waters yesterday, I think, looking for shared heads. Uh, uh, there's over 260 basins that are shared by two or more countries. 40% uh, of the world's population lives in those countries. Many of those basins are water stressed, you know, some of those in the air, uh, orange and others. And when you begin to look at those water issues, look at the social, some of the cultural, some of the economic factors that can contribute to instability, you can begin to identify certain basins where water might be a source of tension between countries. Now, I personally don't think you're going to see a war between countries over water. It's very difficult uh, to actually have one, and there are very few basins in the world where the conditions are actually right where something like that might happen. But what I think you are going to see, and you know, Peter's a better expert on this than I am, you're going to see an uptick in, in local conflict over water resources, things that happen within a country, local com communities uh, fighting over water resources, uh, or states going back and forth over water resources, kind of things that we see here in the United States. Country versus country conflict, I think, is going to be extraordinarily rare, and there's a number of reasons for that. We can go into that later if you'd like. Uh, so why does water matter? Well, it's basic human need. Everybody needs that. I don't have to talk about that. Uh, the dignity issue, again, this gets back to sanitation, not having access to sanitation, not having a separate place where you can actually go to the bathroom. It's relationship to economic growth, uh, poverty reduction, conflict prevention, things like that. Two things I didn't talk about. As a diplomat, water is a great tool to bring countries together. In places where countries aren't talking to each other about any other issue, I can use water as a tool. If they share, let's say, a river system, I can use water as a tool to bring them together, sit them around the table, and begin to have conversations and get them used to engaging each other on some sort of issue. 
And last, and you heard this a lot from Secretary Rice, and you'll hear this a lot coming up in the future as well, you know, democracy building. Uh, I think Lee made this point this morning about uh, the next step in their process is to go out and work with local communities to reach a decision on how these plans actually work. That's democracy. That's democracy in action. One of the, one of the quotes I heard from a grant recipient that we had in Latin America, they, uh, they told me the first time they ever voted was when they elected somebody to their water board. Uh, and that's fundamentally about democracy, making decisions, bringing stakeholders and engaging stakeholders. Water is a great way to do that. It's one of the best means that we have internationally to begin to demonstrate how we can involve communities in decision making. A little bit about the future. Uh, experts think and by 2025 over a billion people will face absolute water scarcity. I actually like this figure in part because it makes a distinction between these countries in red, which will not have enough water on a per capita basis to meet their needs, and these countries in orange, where the water is there, but it won't be managed in a way that will allow those needs to be met. And so you have two different types of challenges. In many places, you have a challenge of augmenting supplies or reducing demand. And in many places, then, it's a management issue, where, these, where the water is available, and if things were done right, they could actually meet those needs. So I think it's important to make that distinction, and it plays out differently in how you want to approach those kinds of countries. And again, we've heard a lot about climate and its impacts on water. Uh, and uh, leaving sea level aside, there are going to be fluctuations in how much water falls in certain places, either more or less. I think the bigger challenge is going to be the changes in hydrologic variability. Uh, that already is a huge issue for many of the countries that we deal with. Climate, is like, uh, climate change is likely to exacerbate that hydrologic variability, and that's going to represent a much greater challenge to many, many of these countries that we're trying to work with now. Uh, so let's say you're convinced and you agree that this is an issue that we should be working on as a, as a government. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you're going to face? And I'm not, I could spend an hour on each one of these easily, but I think this point has already been made. You guys have just, just over the last day and a half, you've heard about the complexity of managing some of the issues with surrounding water. You know, water is a technical challenge. It's a social challenge. It's a cultural challenge. It's an environmental challenge. It's a navigation challenge. It's a financing challenge. Uh, understanding those relationships, being able to manage each of those things separately is a huge challenge. Being able to do that collectively is, a, is an incredible challenge. And building that capacity in the developing world is, is a huge, huge issue. And it isn't, we're not just talking about training one or two people. You know, to do this right, you need thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the developing world who have this capacity and these capabilities. That's going to be a huge issue, building that capacity internationally. Uh, lack of resources. The estimates vary widely depending on exactly what it is that you're trying to do, but, it, but people predict anywhere between 35 to $180 billion a year is necessary to meet some of these challenges in the developing world. Even if you took all of the world's official development assistance together, all the money we give for every other health issue, every other development assistance issue, and added that all and spent it in water, it won't be enough. That's not going to solve this problem. We're going to have to find ways to mobilize resources from a variety of sources, and much of that's going to have to come from in-country sources. So how we do that, very, very big challenge. Lack of cooperation, not just between countries, but even inside a country and a community. Again, Lee pointed this out very well this morning. You need a lot of different stakeholders at the table to be able to make these decisions. The ag minister needs to talk to the health minister, needs to talk to the education minister, needs to talk to the water minister. All these people need to work together, and that's not always the case in many governments that we work with. Uh, how do we make that happen? Uh, and, and last but not least is, is the lack of political will. I, I don't think any of these challenges are insurmountable. If a country is dedicated to solving these problems, they can. Uh, we heard the example from Mark this morning of South Africa. Here's a country that made it a political goal to solve these problems for their people. And they're making great progress doing that. Uh, this is probably the most important aspect of solving any of these problems and that is when countries have the political will, they, they can do it. Uh, so what are we at the State Department doing? Um, uh, just to give you a, a sense of what our day-to-day -day existence looks like, one is we're working to build a constituency for these issues. We work to build a constituency within, within the administration, we work to build a constituency within Congress, we work to build a constituency with the American public, and we work to build a constituency among our international colleagues and partners. Again, if the key impediment is political will, how do we work to get countries to prioritize access to drinking water and sanitation, sound water management, improved water productivity as part of their national development plans and strategies. That's part of what we do. Uh, two, we try to improve the way that which the U.S. government works on water issues. 
Uh, the department, we manage a broad interagency process and includes 20 some odd agencies in the U.S. government who work on international water issues. Uh, we, we talk about what our goals and objectives are. We try to improve how it is that we deal with these, with these issues. Uh, and then assuming that we have some good ideas of how we should try to go about solving these problems internationally, we work with others in the international community to improve the way the community works to try to address these types of challenges. And we do have some projects and programs uh, a little bit different than AID and those things get mixed up, but we can talk more about that later. Uh, for some of you who don't know, uh, the United States uh, Congress passed what is called the Senator Paul Simon Water for the Poor Act in 2005. It really was a landmark piece of legislation for a number of reasons. Uh, it recognized for the first time the importance of water, not just for the things that we traditionally think about, you know, water important being for human health, but it recognized the importance of water for economic development, for poverty reduction, for women's empowerment, conflict prevention, all those things that we as water people knew, but that legislators never really appreciated. So water was finally recognized as an issue that really does contribute to a number of key issues that are important for our foreign policy. Uh, it codified some of the internationally agreed goals on water. You may have heard about these Millennium Development Goals that exist out there. There are two that relate to water. These are the only two that have ever been embodied in a piece of domestic legislation. Uh, it's a very important step for how the U.S. thinks about many of these international agreements and these international goals. And then finally, it asked the U.S. Department of State to develop and implement a strategy to address these issues internationally. Uh, we have gone ahead and taken a number of steps to do just that. Uh, we have a number of reports on this, and you can find that at the website down below, and I encourage you to look at that for more details. But a number of the things that we have, done, we've defined a vision for what the U.S. government thinks we should be doing on water internationally. And I think the remarkable thing about this is not that first part, I think that's something we all know, but it's the second part. In other words, as part of our vision in water and achieving water security in the world, it's about working with populations to protect them from the adverse impacts that extreme hydrologic impacts can have on them very important thing when we talk about the future and going forward and climate variability, things like that. To achieve that vision, we've articulated a number of goals and objectives. Uh, the three, one to increase access to water sanitation, the other to improve water resources management, and the third to increase the productivity of water resources. I think you've heard a lot about that the last couple of days, so I won't explain them unless you guys ask. The way the U.S. government works on these types of issues, uh, first is capacity building. You know, again, that's the huge gap that we have. And if you think of our agencies, USAID, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, a, a lot of the science agencies are really focused on building capacity in developing countries, on legislative and regulatory reform, creating the enabling environment that allows the governments themselves, the populations themselves, the local communities themselves to be able to manage these issues on their own. Uh, and that's a major part of where we, the United States government, provide our assistance. Uh, diplomatic engagement, again, we work through a lot of vehicles to change the way the international community behaves, both bilaterally and a country-by-country -country basis, but also collectively through vehicles like the, the G8 and the UN Commission on Sustainable Development and on and on and on. Uh, direct investment. Uh, yeah, yes, we do build infrastructure overseas. In most cases, it's small-scale infrastructure. Uh, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, they invest in infrastructure in many developing countries throughout the world. Uh, so we do go out there and build latrines and build wells and things like that. Uh, we do invest in science and technology. Many of the science agencies that, that you guys work with here domestically are also involved internationally. A lot of the technologies that we're using here in the United States, we're trying to bring to the international community to help them better manage their water resources. So the science and technology community the U.S. has very much a part of, part of this process. And of course, we try to work very closely with partners and uh, things like that. I'm trying, I'm trying to look to see if I've run out of time just yet. Um, uh, we do, sorry, we, I did mention we have a number of projects and programs. I'm not going to go into them again. We work very closely on a large range of issues with a large number of actors. I'm happy to talk more about that as you guys see fit. Um, but again, you can find most of the details on this on our website where we talk about some of these reports and things like that. Uh, so I've really run through this very fast. Uh, unless you want to see vacation pictures, we can stop here and talk about. I'll take questions. So sorry. Oh, great. Uh, so Peter, Peter told me not to call on him or the students, so... Go ahead, Peter. <laughs>